What's going on everybody? My name is Dr. Jim Cellini. I'm a board certified practicing veterinary neurologist. On today's episode, I'm going to react to an episode of Dr. Jeff Rocky Mountain Vet. I've had some people throughout the course of my channel comment and message me saying, hey, can you react or go through what you think about Dr. Paul and Dr. Jeff and all these TV veterinarian shows? I thought I would do that today. This episode is close to my heart being a neurologist. We're gonna go through an episode or a segment where a dog named Sydney presents for acute onset pelvic limb paralysis. And I'm gonna to touch on some of the things that they touch on in the show and give you a little bit more detail. Before I get into it, if you don't mind, please hitting the like and subscribe button because that greatly helps the channel grow. And I wanna get this information to out to as many people as I possibly can. All right, let's get started. Right. She seems to be able to move her back legs, but she won't use them at all. Things are getting better, worse, more movement, less movement. No, it's, it's pretty much the same. So I'll stop it right there. If I had to summarize from what the owners there said, it sounds like Sydney has a 48 hour history of sudden onset or acute onset, pelvic limb, paresis, meaning weakness, possibly paralysis. There wasn't a definitive trauma per se, like, you know, nothing like obvious, like a hit by car. So it seems to have just maybe happened on its own. That's usually the case anyway. When dogs do this, it's more of an internal thing rather than some sort of external force. So let's keep going and see what she finds in her exam. Hi. Hi. She does have deep pain, which is important. When I pinched her toe, yeah, she, she noticed it. She mentioned the term deep pain. So what she's doing is when she pinches Sydney's toes, She's looking for Sydney to have a conscious response. And if she has a conscious response to say, hey, stop doing that to my toe, that means that some information is getting through her spinal cord to her brain to tell her that. In other words, there's something about the spinal cord still working. Whereas if there's not, then that means the spinal cord is completely injured across its entire like cross-sectional area. And we test for this and it's so important because this is the main prognostic indicator with any problem that causes spinal cord injury. Put her knuckles down like that does she know to replace them she doesn't so you can see right there she's testing something called proprioception and what she's looking for is if sydney is able to recognize where her feet are in space so you see how she turned them upside down and they just kind of stood there that's abnormal that means that there's that information that proprioception information spatial awareness is not getting up to her brain. So something's blocking that information. And this is really common with spinal cord injuries. It's just a part of the neurologic exam to help kind of figure out, you know, how abnormal they are more precisely. Well, I think what's in order is to take some x-rays of her spine. At this point, it's hard for me to say uh, exactly what happened, if she slipped a disc or uh, has a, br a break or something worse. It's good that she's got, like I said, that deep pain. That's a good sign. My guess, and this is just my guess, is that Sydney probably herniated a disc. A, it's the most common situation, and B, she looks to be, I don't know if she's a mix or a purebred, but she looks to be like a herding dog, possibly like Corgi mixed in there too. So if she's part Corgi, then those dogs are definitely a chondrodystrophic breed and a breed that we see disc herniations in all the time. Um, if she's a herding dog, believe it or not, even though they're not chondrodystrophic, we do see a lot of herniated discs in like Aussies and breeds like that. So that would be my guess. Other differentials for something like this would be like a spinal cord stroke, we call it an FCE or fibrocartilaginous embolism. Another differential could be like a tumor that was just sitting there for a long time and became a problem right now. And then less likely would be something like meningitis, either her immune system acting up and causing it or an infection. And then finally, like a trauma, like a hit by car or something else. But usually those things are obvious and they bring with them other obvious signs of external trauma like skin wounds and things like that. Oh, all right. It's okay, it's okay. She's like the mother hen. She's super loving. She's the liquor of the family. It's always the nicest dogs that suffer problems in my experience. So I can pull up these x-rays. The issue I'm worried about this spot here though She's painful just right in this area. So the big thing I see in this x-ray is that there's some spondylosis at L2-3, but that's pretty common and incidental a lot of the time, and there's no way that's gonna make Sydney paralyzed. What I do see is that some of the disc spaces look a little bit narrow, like around T12-13 and T13-L1, I think that might be. 
is that I gotta get a little bit on my soapbox here. X-rays don't really tell you much when it comes to spinal cord injuries. You're just really never gonna see a problem that's obvious and definitively diagnosed on an X-ray. In general, when we see dogs for acute paralysis like this, I don't recommend taking X-rays because I know that I'm gonna do an MRI. All it does is rule out like an obvious trauma, but unless there's an obvious trauma in the history, that's just unlikely. And if the cost difference of a couple hundred dollars for an x-ray makes the difference to an owner, I would say it's not mandatory to do that. I'm not saying she's wrong by doing it, there's like no harm in doing it, um, but just wanted to kind of put that out there too. And maybe uh, she had like a previous disc issue there and with that dog fight with her getting lunged on that it you know tweaked it further and caused more damage perhaps caused the remaining disc to rupture out and uh, impact the spinal cord now that is entirely true so what she's saying here and she's explaining this very well and on camera i might add so that's like not easy to do what she's explaining is how sydney may have had a disc herniation and it kind of like came out a little bit and then with more activity and with kind of, you know, more hard plate intensive exercise, more of that herniated disc material might have come out and then pushed on the spinal cord more. And that's why she got worse clinically. So treatment for this is surgery. So typically they require an MRI and uh, the surgery is typically also done by a specialist. So we can't do it here. Our best option is to hospitalize her and put her on a very strong course of steroids. So she touched on a lot here. This is a really common situation for owners to be in. Um, what she's offering them is the option to go to a specialist like what I do, I do neurology, get an MRI, and then possibly have surgery to remove a herniated disc. And the reason we recommend that is because it gives them the best prognosis and the best chances of walking again. Um, and that usually, that process usually takes like two to six weeks or so. Uh, but that's like the gold standard. Unfortunately, the cost of an MRI and a surgery is anywhere between like seven to $10,000, depending on what market you live in. She mentioned that to them, but you know, it doesn't sound like their owners are, you know, able to do that, which is sad. And again, another reason why I advocate for pet insurance, because pet insurance a lot of times would reimburse you for 90% of that cost. Shout out to pet insurance. But option B would be to do what is called medical management. And medical management is what she mentions, which is using an anti-inflammatory like a steroid, pain medication, and giving this time. When dogs have that deep pain, their prognosis, even with medical management, is honestly like not bad. Like it's in the somewhere of like the 50 to 75% chance that with time she'll get back on her feet and walk again. And this is kind of the take home message I wanna put out there is just because you can't do an MRI and surgery doesn't mean you have to euthanize your pet. If you're willing to give it time and you're able to care for them while they're paralyzed, they oftentimes can recover without doing those procedures if it's a disc herniation. It's a ruptured disc. Yeah. At least one or mm -hmm. more. Right. Mm -hmm. But you know, that initial trauma is not reversible at this point. It's another super smart thing she touched on is that the initial trauma of a disc herniation the concussion, if you will, to the spinal cord is not something that you can fix. You can't do anything to that. There's no surgery, no procedure. That's the part of the injury that just takes time to heal. The point of the surgery is to remove the compressive disc material, relieve the compression, get rid of that side of the injury. So like she knows a lot about this. Yeah, and I mean, she is 13. I would worry a little bit about putting her through the surgery I and all that. I'm not even gonna consider the surgery. So this part I do have to disagree with. I am a strong advocate of the mantra that age is not a disease. Disease is a disease. So if you are a 13 year old dog, but you don't have any other underlying comorbidities and your blood work looks fine and all that, I routinely recommend doing surgery, at least offering to do surgery, if I think it's gonna give them the best chance again. My personal record for the oldest dog I've ever done surgery on is a 17 year old Pekingese, believe it or not. And that dog did great after her needing a disc, so. I say we try the, the steroids and see mm -hmm. where it takes us. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Yes. Okay. Good girl. Right. This is a good girl. Yes. So she knows. Sydney is so resilient. I believe that she's gonna. This this treatment will help her. So how's Sydney doing? She's doing good. She's eating and drinking. With Sydney on the steroid treatment. Um, she's doing fine uh, so far. She ate her breakfast, which is a good sign that she's not nauseous or feeling uncomfortable, which happens sometimes with the steroids. So, so far, so good. Unfortunately, I don't detect any improvement in her mobility, but 
most cases they need longer for that to start to come back. Yeah, I would want to give Sydney somewhere in the neighborhood of like four to six weeks to kind of judge her final outcome. Usually what we do is recheck at the two week mark and the six week mark after an injury like this, if we're doing surgery or medical management. Oh, She's been real good the whole time she's been here. I have not really noticed a, an improvement in the Let's mobility. And that's not the end of the world. So I do, I do want to point that out. The biggest thing is so long as they're not worse, meaning if she lost that deep pain sensation subsequently, that would be a really negative prognostic indicator. But if she's the same or better these first couple of days, that's fine. So that takes time for us to say definitively if it's permanent or not. And we can continue sort of her care at home. Right. I have some basic rehab exercises. And um, what you're going to do is you're going to flex the leg all the way and, and then extend it. So this is called passive range of motion or PROM, PROM, whatever you want to call it. But uh, it's a very basic and easy thing that owners can do at home to kind of keep the muscles kind of limber and keep them from locking up when they're paralyzed like this. This is a pretty standard part of the at-home care regimen. The other thing we instruct owners to do is to manually express their dog's bladder. Think of the bladder behaving just like the back legs are behaving. If the back legs are paralyzed, the bladder is going to be paralyzed as well. If the bladder is paralyzed, it doesn't empty, it keeps filling up and that predisposes them to urinary tract infections because stagnant urine is really nice for bacteria to grow in. Um, permanent bladder wall damage where it just will never work normal again, or even sometimes bladder rupture. If you're not sure how to express your dog's bladder, there's a really good website uh, from AMC, that's the Animal Medical Center in Manhattan. They have a nice YouTube video, I'll link in the description below. But passive range of motion and bladder care are two things we always instruct owners to do with paralyzed pets. There you go. Hi, so this is a nice final point. So it shows, and I think they're trying to do this with the segment, it shows that some dogs, many dogs, are actually quite happy and go on to lead pretty good lives with a cart even after being permanently paralyzed. Um, this is not for everyone and everybody views this sort of situation differently. But in my opinion, if you're okay with it and if you're up for the kind of long-term care of a paralyzed pet, um, you know, hey, it, many dogs do very well with a cart. So I, I don't think it's a bad thing a lot of the times. For everybody who's like, no, it's unfair for a dog to be in a cart, Look at this dog and tell me this dog is not happy. And without them. I... He runs around the clinic. He... He owns it. It's quite a contraption. It's really easy to put on it. He's completely happy. He's comfortable. This does not look like a dog that is like in misery long term. So just a little bit of soapbox. It takes two seconds to put it on and off. Very nice. So they didn't follow up with Sydney. You know, even if she doesn't recover, she may be fine and live it the rest of her happy life in a, in a cart. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. I wanted to provide a little bit of extra information there on top of a very popular veterinary television show. Um, again, if you please don't mind hitting the like and subscribe button before you go today and leave a comment below and let me know what you think. And also let me know if you want me to react to any other of these types of episodes, Dr. Paul, Dr. Jeff, uh, ER Vet, there's a bunch of other ones. Um, but let me know in the comments and I will see you guys in the next video. Thanks a bunch.